with us. She is a journalist and she is an amazing supporter of Julian Assange. I'm really excited to uh, speak with her about the current issues with Assange, about the normalization of, uh, of his situation right now and any updates she has to share with us. Welcome, Cassandra. It's How many hours see- are you on now? I, I think I did nine hours yesterday, and I think, I don't know, maybe five now. <laughs> you're something like that. Same. I don't know how you're doing it. I don't either, honestly. That was an awesome interview at Jimmy. Job. Jimmy, Jimmy Dore is fantastic, and I'm so excited yeah. he was able to join us. Um, so what are, what are some of the, uh, do you have any updates from uh, Julian Assange or, or his team at all that you can share with us in yeah. the last few weeks? No, I haven't really heard much. Um, last time that I talked to his lawyer, he said that things were basically the same, which is not good because they weren't good. Um, he said that, you know, nothing has really ramped up necessarily, but it's been bad this whole time. So um, not, that's ex- not ideal. <laughs> yeah, that's extremely worrying. And I know that uh, in one of the recent videos that you've produced, uh, and you make amazing to the point videos that really do help uh, the the campaign for Julian Assange reach a wide audience. You mentioned that uh, his team was concerned about the normalization of his situation and the normalization of this unbearable situation. So I don't know if you had any like additional thoughts you wanted to add to that or to speak about again. Um, well, it's been normalized. <laughs> That's the problem. Um, he's been in there for so long that people just think that normal and it's it's really really not normal like it's not normal to have a publisher and a journalist having to hide in an embassy for six years or not hide but be in political asylum without sunshine without doctors um that's not normal and people treat it as if it is and that it's horrifying because who's next like once there's not a julian assange there's gonna be somebody else eventually and what happens to them? Do they get droned? Do they like, what, where does it go from here? Um, Exactly, exactly. And I think that's an incredibly important point that the media does not address at all. And it's ridiculous because they should be the ones, as you're saying, that are directly uh, concerned with their future if Assange is is successfully persecuted in this way. It's totally ridiculous. I mean, you have all these journalists who freak out like the sky is falling if Trump tweets like a a silly meme about CNN and they're like, free press is under attack. It's under attack. And meanwhile, our government is going after somebody for talking to sources and publishing factual information during a campaign, which is the when uh, like under our First Amendment or actually under Citizens United, um, they say that you know, the First Amendment and free speech is to be the most protected during an election season because that's when the truth is the most important. And so it, it's it's crazy. They're like, the sky is falling. Trump tweeted a thing. But then we have Julian Assange sitting in embassy for six years and they're silent or cheering it on in some horrible examples. It's it's really frustrating. <laughs> Sorry. No, it absolutely is. No, no, no. no, no absolutely. <laughs> That's exactly the type of conversation that we're really um, happy to have here because nobody else is speaking about it. There is nobody else um, outside of the wonderful guest panelists that we've had, uh, you know, in the mainstream uh, le- and legacy press outlet sort of situation. There is no large, um, loud voice for Julian Assange, and that is why we're here. Um, so absolutely not off topic. To I mean, the New York Times, every single newspaper relies on leaks, scoops, and secrets. That's what the media is. They could be next. They could publish. I mean, Rachel Maddow went on TV and asked for people to send Trump's tax returns to her. How is that any different than WikiLeaks hitting up Don Jr.? If, you know, like, well, that's exactly the same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. It- Go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, you're fine. I'm really riled up about this. No, that's that's absolutely fantastic. People should be upset about it. People should be upset about it and calling it out for what it is. And I feel like it's been left to independent journalists uh, like yourself to report on this where Legacy Press won't. And um, I'd like to ask you like, to speak about, about WikiLeaks and how it's influenced your journalism and how it has allowed you to, to um, practice as a journalist and ha- what would be different uh, in your, your professional life if WikiLeaks didn't exist. 
if WikiLeaks didn't exist, I mean, lots of people would be really happy because I would still probably be an audio engineer and there would be no writing for me at all, no political opinions. I mean, I wasn't even on social media until like 2012 or something. I joined Twitter only to follow WikiLeaks. So I had no social media accounts. I was like just a weird, you know, Greenpeace mm -hmm. person who wanted to save the whales. And then um, my friend had been killed in Afghanistan and I really was anti-war, but not, you know, I wasn't on social media. I wasn't a writer. And then WikiLeaks came out and I was like, oh my God, somebody's actually going to do something to get our friends home. And I just fell in love. And so I started following them and um, reading all of the things that they were doing, which led me to get more interested in privacy rights and internet and things like that. And it just snowballed from there. So I completely, I mean, it's all their fault. <laughs> all their fault that I'm annoying everybody on Twitter every day. That's incredible. And I think that's actually one of the most direct uh, causative stories I've heard of all the panelists. I don't think I've ever heard um, any of them speak so uh, stridently about the role that WikiLeaks played in them uh, entering independent media or journalism in general. That's incredible that they inspired that for you. Yeah, I mean, I was just, you know, I was stealing bunnies from fur farms and stuff. I was like a little animal rights activist and they completely changed my life, actually. I would be in a very different situation right now, probably. <laughs> so, um, and they're they're they, they're so good about boosting up independent media and journalists and people who otherwise would get no attention from you know mainstream media and stories that would get no attention from mainstream media. I know with you too, like they they are always amplifying disobedient media, which is wonderful because you guys kick ass and. It's, it's really cool. Like they, they really try and like, you know, encourage people to be doing good work. And um, we need that. We need people who are willing to like help amplify voices and stories. And it's cool. An issue. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think it's really, it, it is a sad state of affairs that um, it, that it takes uh, little no-name uh, outlets like disobedient media to bring up subjects that should be spoken about by legacy press outlets, and they aren't. And so that's why it, it is left to us to report on those subjects. And that's the only reason that disobedient media exists is because we saw the, uh, the, the absolute hypocrisy and the lack of accuracy in press coverage, um, specifically on the WikiLeaks releases of the Podesta emails, the DNC emails. That was the inspiration um, for us to form Disobedient Media. And on that subject, uh, Cassandra, I was wondering if I could actually bring uh, William on to join us. Yes, um, obviously, and, of course. And speak about, because we're all three independent journalists, and I thought we could have a great conversation on all of this. So yeah, I will do Great. So everyone, if you don't know, uh, William Craddock is my colleague at Disobedient Media. He is the co-founder of Disobedient Media, and uh, he is a fantastic reporter. He focuses on geopolitical issues, and I'm promoting him to panelists right now. Welcome, William, and uh, glad that you've been able to make it. We can see you. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Welcome. I believe yeah. that your mic is, we can't hear you. Uh, you're not muted on Zoom, but it looks like your, your uh, computer mic might be muted. Wait, now you are muted on, on Zoom. Yeah, there you go. Does, can you try speaking now? We still can't hear you. I don't know what's... Uh, do you have any sort of um, setting? Do you have an external mic or uh, any setting on your microphone that would be off? That's very bizarre. We haven't run into this issue with anyone before. This is incredibly odd. Okay, I'm going to ask my tech team really fast if we have any options that we can use. One moment.
Do you want me That's to talk right. about WikiLeaks for a minute? While we figure absolutely, it out? absolutely. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. The only question I have for William is if you have an external mic that you can plug into your computer, that might that that might be something that you could attempt uh, right now. But yes, Cassandra, I would love to hear your thoughts on WikiLeaks and Julian Assange and. Uh, you know, what they mean to you. I know that we've discussed their influence on your journalism, but personally, how they've affected your life and, and what they mean to you. Um, well, I, I mean, I touched on that a little bit. I wouldn't be a writer <laughs> if it wasn't for WikiLeaks. Um, I, I just, they're so inspiring and um, he's so brilliant, you know. Julian is such a gift to this world. Um, he, he really, really just inspires me quite a bit. And the freedom of press is such an important issue. And if we don't take it seriously, we're going to end up in a bad situation real quickly. Um, you know, Trump's own lawyers have been defending WikiLeaks, and I don't think this has been getting enough coverage in the mainstream media at all. Um, Trump's team, like Trump's administration has actually been horrible. Um, Session said that, you know, arresting Assange is a priority. Pompeo said that they're a, a hostile intelligence, uh, non-state intel intelligence service. Um, they've been horrible. The Trump administration has not been helpful in this at all. But uh, Trump's lawyers, they're arguing against a lawsuit right now, not the lawsuit that WikiLeaks is named in, but they're being sued by some former Obama lawyers. And they've been making a brilliant case for why WikiLeaks committed no crimes. And I hope that they take this into consideration instead of using it just for self-serving purposes. I say this all the time and I write about it all the time, but I think it's really, really important that we hold his feet to the fire and be like, listen, you're using these arguments for your benefit and now you're going <laughs> to use them for the proper reason. Um, so I like to try and put that out there as much as possible because it's it's going to really bother me if he wins this and based on WikiLeaks committing no crimes and then Julian is still sitting there without health care and without anything. Um, yeah. It's absolutely intolerable and inhumane and just downright evil that this has been able to transpire in the way that it has, not only with the silence of establishment media, but also with the Guardian and other, and other outlets almost cheering it on. It's absolutely disgusting to watch. Um, so what is uh, your take on some of the press coverage that we've seen, um, not just from The Guardian in a negative sense, but also from, from um, independent media outlets like the World Socialist website who have uh, really promoted the actions and support that we have seen for Julian Assange on the ground in different areas? I am absolutely not a socialist, <laughs> but they are one of my favorite websites and I, I tweet them out all the time and nobody even bothers giving me crap about it because they're actually really, really, really good. Um, their articles are so well written. They're kicking butt. Um, they've been like really like strongly supportive of Julian and I stand with absolutely anyone, no matter their politics, <laughs> as long as they care about protecting free speech and therefore Julian, um, or free press and free speech. So, big fan. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. So, William, if you can try speaking again, I understand that you feel like you've uh, fixed the audio issue. Can you hear us, William? Matt, I have, we have not had technical issues like this so far during the entire stream. That is bizarre. Maybe try restarting Zoom. Because the first time I loaded it, there was a pop-up box that said, um, do you want to use your mic? And you might have clicked no by accident. Interesting. Sorry, that's, that's me typing. I don't mean to have my mic on and, and have you all listen to that, but... Okay, yeah, so William says that he cannot hear us, yeah. which is another bizarre issue. So... Um, at this, I don't, I don't know exactly what, to, how to go from here. Well, I'm going to hear you, but I think I fixed the, the microphone issue. Yeah, oh, we can hear you. Hear you. you. You can't hear us. That's the issue now. Oh. So, so that is annoying and bizarre. So we fix one issue and then we have another issue that is the opposite happen. Riz ridiculous. A question in the chat. Yeah. So as we, as we, uh, discuss this issue, I will, um, I will try to ask uh, William some questions by typing and he's asking me to uh, remove him from the chat and then he will try to rejoin. And so I'm looking forward to William doing that in just a moment. So yeah, um, I know William is speaking to me right now over a text. So just a minute while we figure out this situation.
So Cassandra, though, could you just um, speak a bit about, um, you know, the the specifically the human rights abuses that have happened uh, to Julian Assange to those to those who may have only joined the stream relatively recently and who aren't up to speed on the the abuses that he suffered at the hands of Western governments. Yeah, so actually Elizabeth has a fantastic article on this and I highly recommend going and finding it on Disobedient. I will tweet it out after. But um, he is being tortured. I mean, what's happening to him? I don't even know where to begin with the human rights abuses that are happening. There's, there's so many. I mean, we don't even treat our worst prisoners the way that Julian is being treated. I mean, we have pedophiles and serial killers who are you know, they get to go outside for an hour a day, they can make phone calls, they, half of them have email, most of them can use email now in the prison system, they get visitors, they, you know, they have more freedom than he does right now as a political prisoner, or as a, a political refugee, technically. Um, and that's really horrific, like, that's horrible. <laughs> Um, you know, his doctors that visited him put out a plea to get him to a hospital and the UK government is refusing. He hasn't had fresh air. Um, his eyesight is suffering because he doesn't have to adjust to seeing far distances. Um, there's just so many things like think about what you were doing two months ago. Like I've done so many things in two months. Um, it feels like almost a different lifetime because of how fast our news cycle goes now. And... <laughs> And he's been stuck this whole time without any voice and without any friends or companionship. It's a really tragic thing to do. Hey, there's Will Absolutely. And I believe we've now fixed all of the audio issues, both from William's mic and, and for, from us to William. So uh, I'd like to just ask you, William, about your perspective as well on WikiLeaks, as far as the impetus it gave you to uh, become an independent journalist. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, are we, are we, Clear? Can you hear me? Yeah, Excellent. we can hear you now. Um, I just want to start by saying that uh, WikiLeaks not only has been a huge inspiration to our work, but has been such a valuable resource in that uh, we have used them extensively. Uh, I personally have used them in my research into things like political corruption, uh, human trafficking, and, and political connections to that topic. Uh, when when researching geopolitical issues in the Middle East and European Union and uh, and and South America, for example, uh, and, and to have all of that data available. Uh, to the public and available in a format that is uh, something that you can easily search through, um, that you can access without uh, too much trouble uh, is, is really something that's amazing. It's an amazing resource to have. Um, what I really do appreciate the, the, the Julian, about Julian Assange of what WikiLeaks has done is that they've re they have, not to use a, a cliched analogy, but they have really revealed the, the matrix-like system that, that the public exists in. And, and they've shown uh, a, a list of topics that can and cannot be discussed, and they've really laid that bare uh, to the public eye. They've shown the shallowness of the image of the world that is projected to the public by uh, the media and by uh, the political establishment around the world. And they've revealed, I think, really the controlled nature of political discourse in particular. It allows us, most importantly, to have uh, an honest political dialogue and an unveiling of the truth. And it, it allows us to see the world in a, in, in a way that is much closer to how it really is um, than, than how others would like us to see it. And definitely uh, uh, more accurate than any other journalistic organization out there in existence at the moment. And I think it's really, um, you know, fascinating that as independent journalists, all of us, um, although we are all independent journalists, we all come from different parts of the political spectrum. And yet WikiLeaks and the truth that it brings us all uh, appeals to all of us because we all put uh, truth above ideology in that way. And I think that is something that is a universal appeal of WikiLeaks. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. The truth that they uh, give us is valuable to everyone. And uh, I don't know if Cassandra, if you have uh, just opinions on, on that or on the fact that, uh, you know, uh, an event like this, uh, Unity 4J is such a uniting force for uh, support for WikiLeaks, no matter where you come from. Yeah, I absolutely love the when you guys get everybody together. It's amazing. There's nobody on here who has like really that close of 
political views and everybody still comes together for a common cause. And we need to be doing that more, not even just for Julian. I mean, most importantly for Julian, but I mean, we should be doing this with war and with, there's a lot of things that people across the political spectrum can agree on, but nobody is working together because nobody's talking. And that is how people in power stay in power. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. How bad things continue, you know? Um, so by working together and realizing where you can work together, then you become so much more powerful, <laughs> even if you hate certain things. I mean, there's lots of things that I say that people absolutely despise, I'm sure. But I'm always happy to like reach across the aisle to work on something, especially if it's war or WikiLeaks. And I feel like we just have so much more power that way. And I love seeing other people willing to do the same. So it's really cool. <laughs> I feel exactly the same way about this this event and, and the kind of hope that it, the glimmer of hope that it gives us that this, as you said, can be applied to different causes. And uh, turning uh, to you, William, I wanted to ask you about your opinion on, on the future of um, the situation with Ecuador, because I know that you wrote a pretty extensive piece on South America recently. So I was wondering if you had insight on the geopolitical situation Ecuador is in right now. Yeah, well, I think that uh, in relation to uh, Assange's unfortunate situation right now, Ecuador is in is in kind of an interesting place. Of course, uh, most people realize by now that they have uh, the U.S. military and intelligence communities, uh, or at least factions within them, bearing down on Ecuador, on uh, on Lenin Moreno, uh, to to pressure him uh, to to stifle uh, Assange's voice. But what's also been going on is that there's this really there's a there's a a conflict going within South America uh, to decide whether it's going to be uh, left leaning groups or right leaning groups that are going to control the continent. Um, we're seeing the opening stages of of uh, for lack of a better term a Latin Spring. And, uh, and there's going to be a conflict between these two factions. And Ecuador is a part of that because uh, Ecuador uh, is a member of the Foro, of, uh, Foro de Sao Paulo. Uh, it's, a, it's a community of left-leaning countries within South America, and they're competing with other countries. Uh, Brazil, Argentina are, are two examples of that. And, uh, and so Moreno is caught in kind of a rock and a hard place because Assange, uh, what Assange does is he, he pokes at the political status quo, and it, it hurts... Uh, the sensibilities of people in the U.S. and people in Europe who might have a stake in um, in how things play out in South America. So when you see uh, when you see the, the silencing, you, it, it's it's important to remember there are just so many uh, factors at play in what is going on, and it's such a complex uh, situation. You know, when Assange spoke out against uh, Catalonia. Uh, and about the situation there that has been going on with the suppression of their referendum to seek independence. Uh, he really offended a lot of uh, groups within the European Union. And, you know, those groups have sway in uh, various South American countries, including Ecuador. So there's just a lot of there are really a lot of factions coming together right now to uh, stifle his voice. And that's really it's really unfortunate to see. Yeah. And I think that that's actually a point that is and and. Uh, and the Catalonian independence movement, um, Assange uh, has been very clear that he supports uh, Catalonian self-determination He um, because a lot of news outlets have tried to smear him by saying that he's like uh, preaching for independence and that's not true. He's He was just for uh, self-determination. But um, I think it's really important to build on what you said about the fact that, um, you know, he knowingly, I mean, Assange is a very intelligent human being. I think we all agree with, on that. I think we all recognize that. And I think that um, he would have known full well uh, who that he was, um, you know, antagonizing people that had relationships with Ecuador. So I think that the fact that he went ahead and supported Catalonian self-determination so vocally is actually uh, an indication of his selflessness. And it's the same way uh, that we've seen him advocate for journalists, other journalists' welfare, even after he was gagged. So it's an incredible um, indication of his character, I think. And I think that that is one of the aspects of uh, his life that is not is, is forgotten amongst the smears and the establishment press defamation of him. Yeah, absolutely. Assange and WikiLeaks play a very important role in a greater process of uh, breaking the status quo, you know, uh, breaking the grip of the establishment that has really had a strong hold on the, uh, the West as a collective unit uh, for at least, you know, for, for many decades. And, and I think that, uh, I think that they do it quite well. And they are, and, and something that I really respect about Assange is he is really, uh, 
he is uncompromising in, in his dedication to the ideals that he believes in, the ideals that he founded uh, WikiLeaks under, and that the organization uh, and, and himself continue to uh, pursue in their day-to-day -day operations. You know, Absolutely. What I, you know what I love about him so much? And it's such a stupid small thing, but he, um, he still will not say that Chelsea Manning was the source, even though she talks about it all the time. He's always like our alleged source. And it's like, she talks about it all the time, dude. I just, I think that's so great. They like, he's not even willing to give up a source after they give up themselves, <laughs> like, you know? And I think that just really speaks to his character and his principles and just how dedicated he is to, you know, what he does and how he protects his sources. and. I think that's really impressive. Yeah. It's like a stupid little thing, but I notice it every time and I'm like, that's so cute. It's <laughs> not stupid at all. I mean, I think that's that's definitely part of the advocacy that he's done for uh, Chelsea Manning. From the very beginning, WikiLeaks was such an advocate for her, not just protecting the fact, you know, the the alleged fact that she was a source, but, uh, but you know, but absolutely going to bat for her against the deep state. And then for uh, Ed Snowden and for all of these people, whether they were an alleged WikiLeaks leak source or not right. um if they are whistle whistleblowers julian assange has has absolutely advocated for them and we know with edward snowden that that led to uh you know the uk pressuring sweden to continue its investigation for years so multiple times as as uh william referenced multiple times he has probably most likely knowingly um endangered his own situation in order to speak the truth as he saw it so i think what you're talking about uh cassandra is a is a huge part of, of the character of Julian Assange that is not spoken about in legacy media. Yeah. I think they like to paint him as this arrogant, like horrible person. And that's just not true. He's so warm and intelligent and he's just a brilliant guy. And he can be intimidating because he's so smart, but it's not in an arrogant way. It's just, that's just who he is. He's just a brilliant person. And yeah, I think that it, they really go out of their way to smear him and they're very incorrect all the time. <laughs> so. Absolutely. And they get so desperate that I remember um, right before uh, Julian Assange was silenced or, or maybe it was right after, I believe there was a, a, an, uh, a smear campaign uh, tactic that went around um, just, just the most uh, middle school kindergarten level um, at home and attacks about the, about his like uh, cleanliness and just, just ridiculous levels that they'll go to to smear he him. Smell right? bad. He did not. He does not smell bad. That is completely fake news, and I will call bullshit on that every single time. Bullshit. Um, yeah, that the fact that's yeah, such a stupid smear campaign too. Like who who even comes up with that? Like we're gonna write an article claiming that somebody smells bad. Like you're a serious journalist, and that's what you're gonna do today. <laughs> like I would be horrified putting that out. Exactly. I mean, they are the, with their reaction to Julian Assange, they're showing their own um, not only maturity but uh, the lack of professionalism and the the um, you know they're they're degrading their own credibility in the way that they're attacking him. Um, you know, William, do you have any sort of um, thoughts about the way that the media's attacks on Julian Assange have really shown the public uh, the, their own lack of integrity? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, not only the attacks on Assange uh, have shown that, but also also when you look at what topics they will or will not cover from WikiLeaks releases, how they handle the releases. You know, they've with with almost every single WikiLeaks release, the the mainstream media has approached it from an angle of wanting to to report the bare minimum and distort the facts, even though the data that is published by WikiLeaks is publicly available for anyone who wants to look at it for themselves. Um, but but nonetheless, the media continues to push a distorted view in the hopes that a certain percentage of the population who consumes their news won't take the time to go and search out uh, truth for themselves. That's that's really what I appreciate most about about WikiLeaks. You know, they let the they let the, the truth and the information speak for itself. They hold more or less a, a neutral position, and they simply hold out the data for everyone to to see and come to their own conclusions. You know, 
that that plays into the whole uh, I think the whole culture of censorship that is going on in the UK that Assange was really the canary in the coal mine for. Uh, now we're seeing an, an epidemic of not just uh, uh, silencing of journalists who are reporting on certain topics. You know, the, the Tommy Robinson thing has now become big, but there's also a lot of uh, crackdowns on online, simple online speech by private citizens online uh, within the UK. And it's really unfortunate because I, you know, I've come, I think I, I come from a, a philosophical background that the truth should stand on its own merits. Um, and if, if you cannot have that discourse, uh, that discussion, uh, then, then how are we supposed to make uh, progress as a society? Absolutely. That is exactly actually one of the, the points that Julian Assange I know has made in a number of different interviews is he, he points to the fact that without that information, the pro, uh, progress can uh, uh, progress in terms of our civilization cannot actually take place. So that is a really important point that uh, Julian has brought up multiple times. Um, absolutely. Um, Cassandra, do you have any thoughts on that that you just want to uh, expound on uh, oh. just that issue? Well, I mean, on the differences between how they've covered WikiLeaks releases, I definitely, um, I talked about this a little bit earlier when I was talking to Jack, but um, when Sarah Palin's emails came out, um, Washington Post made a Twitter account that was, I think it was at Palin's emails or something, and they called for volunteers to help them read through all of the emails. That is insane, because look at how they handled the Clinton emails. They acted like this had never happened before, that WikiLeaks only went after a Democrat, but they left out the fact that they published Sarah Palin's emails. And then, you know, we had CNN saying that it's illegal for citizens to read WikiLeaks, which is insane. <laughs> but, you know, fa flashback to, to the Palin run, and they were asking for public help. Um, it's, it's just really interesting how different like and both sides are guilty of this it's not i'm not just picking on the left here because you know back then the right considered julian an enemy of the state and they despised him and so everybody kind of likes wikileaks when they're helping them out um but it, the media has really really just dropped the ball on any semblance of unbiased reporting on wikileaks at all ever and I think that the Palin emails versus the Clinton emails is a perfect example of it. And their their Twitter account is still up from it. I was looking at it the other day and I was just like, this is so night and day from like what they are accusing them of now, you know? Absolutely. And I think that that's um, one of the things that WikiLeaks has done is remove that mask of credibility from the, from the media by forcing them to respond in such a ridiculous way, but also by, as we've talked about multiple times in this vigil, the fact that they have, in the documents WikiLeaks has published, they've shown the interrelationship between the state and the media and, and the various corrupt machinations that go on with that. So um, I can see why the, why uh, certain legacy press outlets would be really um, either both sort of jealous and uh, feel burned by their own exposure of their corruption. Because a few decades ago, we would have just kind of swallowed the stories that they sell us and we wouldn't have, have really realized until much, much later in hindsight that those narratives were wrong. And so now WikiLeaks is doing that in real time. And I know that we've said that multiple times on this stream, but... I thought it was, um, it's, it's really great for those viewers who have only just joined us to remember that. So, yeah. So, I, I think they're the most important I, organization in the world. I honestly, I absolutely believe that Julian and WikiLeaks are the most important, not just press, <laughs> like the most important organization in the world. And I, I would, it's, insane to me that people aren't like marching in the streets and like pulling him out of there and dragging him into another embassy in the middle of a mob you know like they should be doing like there should be people taking the streets for this it's insane that's exactly a point that has been brought up multiple times by a number of different guests on the stream they've all when i when i've i've asked almost everyone you know what do you think the public can do to make a tangible difference and a number of them said that we need this is at a point now where we have to have civil disobedience so, uh, William, what, what do you think if the situation doesn't change or if, God forbid, it worsens, how do you see this um, impacting uh, journalism but also society? Do you think we'll see um, uh, civil disobedience if this uh, gagging continues? 
Yeah, you know, it's it's possible, and uh, and I and I think that um, I would hope that if the situation were to worsen, that some of the groups who have benefited from uh, WikiLeaks releases, who have benefited from their publications, would would decide to step in and do something uh, to help alleviate the situation. It's been a little disappointing to see, you know, during the election, uh, this has been talked about uh, a lot, but I mean, a, a lot of uh, current uh, officials in, in, the, in the Trump administration uh, benefited greatly from WikiLeaks releases. A lot of uh, alternative media organizations benefited greatly from WikiLeaks releases and that they were able to uh, get increased publicity. Uh, there were a lot of groups out there who benefited from the work that WikiLeaks does. But when something goes wrong for WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, uh, there's not many voices speaking out about it. And while it might be hard to realistically change uh, the situation in, in Ecuador, for example, uh, we absolutely can be doing things to lobby with uh, media organizations, for example, to start bringing more attention onto the situation and begin to build that pressure for for something to change with the, with the current status quo. Absolutely. I think that um, that's something we've echoed a, a lot of times during the stream is the importance of people speaking out um, for Julian Assange themselves to raise their voices to make sure that this message is heard. Um, so, Cassandra, what do you want um, uh, our viewers, audience members to do to help Julian right now? Like, what is the, the in your opinion, the strongest uh, action that viewers can take to support Julian? Um, I think that people need to be louder. Um, I know that there's vigils that are happening all over the place on the six year anniversary. We're having one in DC outside the White House. I'm gonna get over my fear of public speaking and probably do it for the first time there. Um, we're gonna you know, really try and get people out to that. I know that there's one in the UK, gotta get people out there. Um, call your senators, write to them, especially if they're like possibly friendly to the cause. Um, email them, write to them, flood them with emails. <laughs> like, um, we need to start really like amping up pressure. Um, tweet at Donald Trump, call out the hip hypocrisy from everyone, like from Katrina, like, or not Katrina, I'm sorry, but like from anybody in the administration, just tweet at everybody. Um, people in Ecuador, the Ecuadorian government, Australian government, just start, you know, spamming everyone. <laughs> Um, I don't really know what else we can do at this point, you know, other than digging a tunnel, <laughs> which I'm not opposed to if anybody wants to help. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about digging a tunnel, but I think that, 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 yeah, we are to really, no, no, I think it's a great, I think it's a, totally uh, kidding though. Uh, I think that, uh, people watching. <laughs> The, po the point stands, though, that this is a desperate situation. And I mean, it was a desperate situation weeks ago, as you have told us in the videos that you've made about this. And do you think that this is being normalized? I mean, we we at Disability Media, you yourself, we've all tried to speak out against this being normalized. But with no news coming out of the embassy in the last couple of weeks, do you think that that is what is happening? And what can we do to stop that um, when there is no news to go on? Um, we just got to keep talking. I mean... There's not really, I've been racking my brain trying to think of what we can do and I've got nothing <laughs> um, other than making videos and let, doing these live streams, write articles, make, you know, memes, put out social media posts, do anything that you can to get people talking. Um, but I, I think it's especially important that you put pressure on, um, you know, members of Congress, members of Senate, like get up get up in there email them be like hey why aren't you standing with free press um i don't know i do you have any good ideas i i think uh probably the, by now the viewers are probably sick of me ranting about my ideas because basically i've, I've said the same thing you know like 20 times but yeah. basically uh, as I've said before, and, and you know, I know that some viewers have just, you know, they pop in and out and that's totally uh, fine because this is such a long running vigil. But I think that uh, what people have to do is going to be different in everybody's, everybody's individual situation. So we have to have to uh, look at our own 
gifts, talents, abilities, tools, our own situations that is unique, that are unique to us and that we can creatively re-engineer to help WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. So the creativity is the major stumbling block. People don't are unable to look at themselves and see how their situation can be used creatively to uh, to help Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. And so um, I, I like using ridiculous examples to kind of like um, sort of sound, examples that sound ridiculous to make it clear to people how how extensive the uh, variety of, of uh, hobbies that can be used to help WikiLeaks and Julian. So like baking, cooking, do a bake sale, have a potluck, you know, invite people over and have a, um, maybe not a watch party, but ha have a gathering where you discuss WikiLeaks. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can support, support this cause that do not have to be writing or public speaking or as Kieran and, and Wise of Action do. You don't have to be standing in the street at a vigil. You can be having a conversation at your home with your family and that is a, a tangible action that will help Julian Assange. One of my um, actual favorite things to do, I, you just sparked my memory. Um, every time that I'm going to a political event or even to, cause I live in DC, like a bar or Trump hotel or any place that there might be anyone with any kind of influence. I always wear my Julian Assange, my free Assange tote bag. So I highly recommend going to WikiLeaks shop and buying stuff. Um, the licensing fees go to WikiLeaks. Um, it's actually a third party company, but they pay licensing fees, which in turn help WikiLeaks do what they do. Um, it sparks conversations every single time. And of course, WikiLeaks is like my favorite topic. So I'm always down. <laughs> If people come up to me constantly and they're like, oh, great bag or, oh, I hate your bag. And then we'll end up talking about it and it's great. Um, I think that's a really easy thing that people can do. Um, the tote bag is my favorite. I have like tons and tons of purses and I take it with me in like to black tie affairs and stuff. So. No, that's that again, that is a tangible action that uh, is unique to your own situation as far as like the events that you're able to go to with that even uh, in a grocery store. You can, you know, yeah. run into somebody and change their mind <laughs> and changing the public, like the general public's mind, too, is a really important aspect of it. Yeah. And I mean, we can all buy, uh, and those of us who are not completely strapped for cash um, can buy merchandise from the WikiLeaks shop, which can then, as you have done, it can be used as conversation starters and as a walking billboard. If you have a WikiLeaks t-shirt on, if you're carrying a WikiLeaks bag, as you do, then you are still uh, raising awareness about Julian Assange and donating at the same time. So that's a really great um, option for some people. Um, but again, if you're strapped for cash, then retweeting on social media, sharing uh, all of the WikiLeaks shirts. Absolutely are, are also raising awareness. And so, uh, William, as we're moving forward, what do you think uh, people should do? I, I ask all the panelists this. What do you want uh, uh, viewers to do to help Julian Assange? What do you think is the most effective method to help in this situation well i think that what we're in this phase where we are we are really fighting uh, an information war for public perception of what's going on with wikileaks right now uh so obviously it's been stated to support them financially uh, in any capacity is is fantastic to um to share wikileaks releases to to continue to utilize the resources that they've provided the public with to continue to uh, show the value of that content um, and continue to spread the information. You know, there are so there are still many things in WikiLeaks releases, many important uh, uh, discoveries that are still waiting to be uh, made uh, made available or made made brought up to the public perception. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, like Cassandra was saying, it's important to be lobbying with people in in uh, not just in the government but but in media particularly, uh, whether it's a large or small organization to continue to give attention to the the detention of Assange, continue to give attention to uh, the corruption uh, and, and the uh, injustice surrounding uh, his isolation. And I think that if we continue to uh, maintain momentum, uh, we have a good chance of building that and eventually uh, breaking the status quo in, in one way or another and, and being able to move forward. Um, I have a question on Twitter, and I don't know the answer, but you guys might, and if not, I can try and find out. But somebody asked if, they said that they know he can receive postal mail, but can he send outgoing mail? 
because if so, he could communicate with the public old school style with a newsletter and we could have volunteer stuff envelopes and publish online. I actually don't know the answer to this. I can try and find out if you guys don't know, but um, yeah, somebody is asking. Well, that would be, you know, if he was able to do that, it'd be a fantastic way to get his voice out into the public and to combat uh, uh, the narratives that are being spun around the situation right now. Absolutely, I completely agree. And I think that um, everything you guys have said, said this evening is so valuable and so correct. And I really hope that that the audience takes it all to heart and really hears what you guys have said. Are there any, um, I'll, I'm, I want to ask both of you this, are there any sort of like final thoughts that you want to add that we haven't covered that uh, you think need to be uh, heard by the supporters of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Um, people who follow Q, <laughs> a lot of you mean really well, but he is definitely, definitely in the embassy. I have tweeted photos of my passport and the book that he signed that's behind me. <laughs> um, he's there. And even if you mean well, um, Trump has not helped him yet. And by, by claiming in, that he is and lying to yourself, pretending that he's safe, um, it actually helps to slow or stop of people who would otherwise be speaking out on his behalf. And we need people's voices uh, more than ever right now. So even though I know that these people don't, aren't all like spreading black propaganda on purpose, um, the only people that it helps are the people who dislike Julian and want him to be harmed. <laughs> No, that is incredibly important for a conservative uh, journalist to point out. And it's especially important, not only because it spreads, as you said, like a black PR campaign against Julian Assange and his interests, but also because, as we recognized previously in, the, in this segment, uh, you know, Donald Trump is one of the few people right now that could have a real huge impact on the outcome for Julian Assange. And so it's more imperative than ever than his, that his base be fired up in in pressuring him to do that. And so, as you've said, the Q narrative that he's not in the embassy and he's safe and it trust the master plan and 16D chess uh, mm -hmm. is definitely harmful. And that's especially harmful because of the influence that the MAGA supporters would otherwise have on the president uh, right. in a positive way for Julian. So, uh, William, I don't know if you have any comments on that or, or uh, just final thoughts in general about this whole situation. Well, yeah, for just to add your comment, did Q predict this? Yeah. <laughs> No, I keep yeah, getting absolutely. DMs asking if I'm Q now, and I'm like, guys, guys, <laughs> like, stop. Yeah, because apparently there's something with Snow White, and I have a Snow White tattoo, so now people are, like, DMing me, and I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, my least ridiculous. Thing. I'd rather, like, it's worse than when people send me penis pictures, I swear. I'm like, you have to stop. <laughs> Just kidding. Right. Yeah, you know, I think that I think it's important for people who support Trump to keep in mind that uh, just because uh, Trump was able to get into office and just because, you know, some good things are happening, you know, the economy is booming, for example, uh, doesn't mean that the fight's over, doesn't even mean that we're uh, through the first or second round. Uh, we still have a lot of work uh, ahead of us to write a situation that for just for many decades has has not been right, has been uh, has been a miss. And I think that people kind of have become lulled by the impression that uh, that there has already been a fix and that things are just going to get better. But that's not guaranteed. Uh, it's absolutely not guaranteed. And people need to keep that in mind and they need to continue to remain vigilant and uh, stay on target. Absolutely. And I think that that is incredibly important for people to take to heart and to definitely act on is exactly what you've said. And um, but I'm going to uh, ask you guys one more time if there's anything else that we haven't covered right now that you would like to share with us. And William, I know you were uh, cut off by being muted at the beginning there. So if there's anything you'd like to cover that we haven't discussed yet, uh, go for it as as we kind of end this segment uh, pretty soon here. No, you know, really, I've been able to make my comments. I just want to, you know, reiterate that uh, my deep appreciation for the work that WikiLeaks does, um, for the valuable resource that they've been to us at Disobedient Media, and, and also just to c commend you on uh, on your in endurance in sticking with this topic. I mean, you've really been uh, uh, like a bloodhound on the trail uh, with with supporting Julian and and keeping the public aware of this uh, situation especially when at uh, times when, when others moved on to other topics or uh, just simply weren't interested in covering it. 
Yeah, and I would say the same exact thing uh, to Cassandra as well. Like we, we independent journalists have been the ones that have refused to allow this story to disappear and to be forgotten. And so I think that it's it's more imperative than ever that the indep- independent journalists who do care about integrity and truth um, do speak out on behalf of Julian Assange. And thank you both for coming. I really, really appreciate uh, your patience with us and our technical problems and took the time out of your both of your busy schedules to speak uh, on behalf of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks uh, to as many people as we can possibly get this message out to. So thank you both very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. <laughs> It's been a pleasure joining both of you. Watching the rest of the night. <laughs> and I hope, and I hope both of you will be uh, back in in our future vigils. If unfortunately we have to have them, uh, I hope we don't. But if we do, I hope to see you both there. Absolutely. Good night. Thank you. Good night.